Okay. So uh, we're gonna talk about the eight domains of geriatric emergency medicine. And what that is really is what the American College of Emergency Physicians feel that you should know as far as taking care of older patients, some special things about older patients. Let them go. Okay, let's try it a different way. Okay, so <clears throat> what are our goals and objectives for this lecture? This pretty short lecture, but we're gonna try to cover uh, some important points until Dr. Willis takes a hook and pulls me out, which he's already warned me about. So we're gonna learn about the why. Why is this important? We're gonna learn about the what, what is this? And then about the how, how we, we wanna try to make things better. Actually, so what is the why, right? We're talking about the graying of America, that America is getting older and older and you're gonna see more and more elderly patients, but who wouldn't wanna take care of that couple, right? <laughs> That's like not wanting to take care of me and Silverberg as two old people. <laughs> but it, Okay, and who certainly would not want to take care of this woman well, right? So another why is that all over the world, not just in America where we see the graying of America getting older and older population, but in the whole world, the geriatric population is increasing and it's actually called the silver tsunami. So in the next 25 years, almost everybody you're gonna see is gonna be old. Even the attendings, Mark. So, so what are the eight domains, right? So they're principles and information, again, that the American College of Emergency Physicians feels are very important for emergency physicians to know that are important to take really good care of elderly patients. So, Huh. There's atypical presentations, trauma, and especially falls, cognitive disorders, interventions in the emergency department as compared to what you would do in younger patients, managing their medications, transition of care. They have a lot of comorbidities, it's called polymorbidity, that there are a lot of different illnesses that can cloud the situation and make things harder to treat them. And a little bit about end of life care. So how do we wanna make things a little better? So we are applying on both sides of the street. One of the reasons I got permission to give this uh, 30 minute lecture was we are applying for geriatric ED accreditation on both sides of the street. And the most important part of getting the ED accreditation from the American College of Emergency Physicians is education for physicians, nurses, and mid-level providers. So this is a start of giving that education. And I've already given some lectures to the nurses at UHB, and we already, Mr. Bergen, who some of you know, is going to be giving more lectures to them. And on uh, Ms. Brewster is going to also be giving lectures on the county side of the to the nurses. And then in addition to education, you wanna have projects to improve the care in the ED, at least one project to start with. So on both sides of the street, we've picked falls as our project to try to improve care for the elderly patients in the, in the ED. So our eventual goal though, is to have a geriatric emergency department inside of the regular department. You don't have to have a different location, but we wanna make the physical plant in the ED safer and more comfortable for the elderly patients. We wanna have a staff that is knowledgeable and dedicated and caring for the elderly patients, which all of you are. And we wanna have more social assistance. 
as far as not just an ED, but after we discharge them. And then we want to have good transitions of care to make sure when we discharge them, they get good follow up, that they get their medications, that they get their appointments, that we check on them and make sure they're safe at home. So let's talk about some of the domains, about the eight domains. So the elderly can present very atypically and that can make diagnosis very difficult. For examples, infections, they may present with very little fever. In fact, for me now, after seeing so many older patients and being older, um, even a temp of 100 orally or, or 100.6 rectally to me is significant fever in an elderly patient. And hypothermia is even more dangerous. Um, and they may not have always the classical signs of infection. So they may come in just being septic, but only having altered mental status without complaining of things like a cough, but yet have a pneumonia without complaining of dysuria or polyuria, but having urosepsis or having a bad decubit eye that's grossly infected, but the patient can't tell you about it. Other atypical presentations are acute coronary syndromes. They can come in without classical chest pain. They may come in just with shortness of breath. There was one study in patients 75 or older that showed the most common presentation of a, an acute MI was shortness of breath and not the classical kind of chest pain. My father, when he had his second MI, which eventually proved fatal, he presented a syncope because he had an arrhythmia due to the ischemia and didn't complain of chest pain till later on. So they can have very atypical presentations of acute coronary syndromes. And we've seen a couple lately with people with epigastric pain that we thought were GI and wound up having inferior wall MIs, right? Acute abdominal pain. So as you get older, your nerves don't relay pain as well. And you may have less pain, even though you have an acute abdomen, you may not have such typical findings, right? Like guarding and a lot of rebound, you know, and chandelier sign, that kind of stuff. So it always means you have to be more suspicious and you have to test more. And my threshold for doing a CT in elderly patients with abdominal pain is a lot less than it is in doing a CT in younger patients. And then trauma, especially from falls, as we'll talk about more, but just from a fall from their own height is really, really a dangerous thing. And they may seem okay at first and then they may deteriorate. So you really want to be very careful when you both triage them, they should be up triage and then when you're evaluating them and then re-evaluating them and then re-evaluating them. Right, so again, atypical presentations can make the diagnosis difficult. So often you find yourself fishing for the diagnosis and you have to do more testing to make the diagnosis. All right, what about geriatric trauma care? So obviously it always starts with the ABCs. But trauma is an important cause of mortality and morbidity in the elderly. And falls is the number one cause. A second most common cause is pedestrian stroke. So I one time tried to cross Queens Boulevard and hardly made it across before I almost got hit by a car. So those are the two biggies that you'll see in geriatric trauma. But falls just from their own height, boom is very, very dangerous. You should be taken uh, very seriously. And trauma is a very big deal for the elderly. Even if they survive it, um, there's increased incidence of them having to go to nursing homes. There's increased incidence of them coming back to the ER repeatedly, and especially of decrease in their ability to take care of themselves and to take care of the ADLs. So again, it's a big deal when they do fall. Um, and if you remember, just about a month ago, we had an M&M &M 
about a woman who had syncopized, hit her face, had some fractures, was admitted to medicine, wasn't thought that there was anything else going on, but she was admitted just for the syncope. And then uh, a couple of days later, she developed a subdural hematoma and wound up being a vegetable and eventually dying. So again, you wanna be very, very careful. Um, you triage them up, you do the basic principles of resuscitation, they really need early and close hemodynamic monitoring as compared to younger people. So this is a picture of my Aunt Frida, right? Who had lived in Sheep's Head Bay for many years, huffing and puffing on her Marlboros. And uh, she developed COPD and eventually around the age of 90 got admitted to an assisted living facility. Was doing okay, had home oxygen at the assisted living facility. And one day she tripped on her oxygen line, true story. Fell, broke her leg and had to have surgery and didn't do well. Got a post-op pneumonia and then had an MI and CHF and wound up dying. So again, trauma in the elderly is a very serious thing. So when you have someone who fell, right? Obviously you wanna know what injuries occurred and you wanna do a good evaluation, right? The ABCs and then head to toe, front to back. And then anything you find, you wanna treat their injuries. But you also wanna know why they fell. Did they syncopize? Did they get dizzy? Did they have trouble with their vision or their hearing? Did their 10 cats get under their legs and they tripped over their cat? Did they have you know, a hole in their rug and fall for that? So you, you really want to evaluate them well, both in the ER, but even after they go home to have follow-up, sometimes they'll need a home visit. They'll need rehab or occupational uh, therapy uh, and social service to help them. When I had my first hip replaced and I had a fracture prior to that, I was on um, complete non-weight bearing and was trying to get around on crutches. In fact, one day I came to work and couldn't make it from my office over to UHB. And when I finally made it to UHB, this man over here made me go home. <laughs> It, what did it take me about a, a half hour? The only time I've ever been late on any shift here. It took me about a half hour to go from my office over to UHB. It took about 20 minutes to close the Yeah. <laughs> so it, it can be very difficult when you have a, you know, when you have trauma in an older person. And in fact, I was taking a shower and I hadn't I gotten the right, you know, things that you hold that you can do like the bars and things. And I was taking a shower and completing on weight bearing and I slipped and I was gonna fall back on my hip. And I reached up and tried to do a one hand pull up thinking I'm Mark Silverberg and really in good shape. And I ripped my rotator and that took months and months to get better too. And it was my own stupidity for not having a safe environment. So we can, if we have someone who fell and we're worried that they may fall again we can arrange to get social service to get a home visit and to make sure they get things like bars and in the bathroom and things like that. So it's not just preventing falls in the ED, but it's preventing falls in the future, finding out why they fell and doing things to keep them from falling. In fact, one of the things that has been shown to help is to go over their medications. One of the problems in falling is uh, that they may be on meds that make them dizzy or give them orthostatic hypotension. Um, and one of the things we're trying to do on both sides of the street, and we actually are already advertising on this side of the street, is to get a pharmacist for the ED. I know some of you have already rotated through Lutheran, and I think you have a pharmacist there. And I've heard it's very, very helpful. And it's one of the things they can do is do medicine reconciliation for patients who had falls and may be able to revise their medications to keep them from falling again. One of the other things that you always wanna consider when you see 
trauma in the elderly is abuse and neglect. I, and both are reportable. It's not as closely mandated in every state as it is for kids, but nothing prevents you from reporting it. So you can report it through social service, even if you're just a suspicious and they can then contact the APS, the Adult Protective Services, which then can decide if they want to do further investigations, et cetera. But because we don't always think of abuse and neglect as something reportable, uh, when you look at the literature, it's something that's very, very much underreported. And we had a case a few years ago in UHB where a patient was sent home who had abuse and then came back really physically beaten up and the police had to be called and their so-called guardian had to be arrested. So what about also cognitive disorders? So altered mental status is very common in the elderly, right? It can be subtle and it can be missed. So you always wanna look for some clues and you want to get a good history. Has there been declining function in this older person? It all starts with the history. And often you may not be able to trust the history of the elderly patient. So this is where you need to talk to the family, where you need to sometimes talk to EMS, where you need to call up, find out what's really going on. And the one thing you don't want to miss is delirium. So delirium is an acute change in mental status due to an acute underlying problem as versus dementia, which is more chronic and psychiatric, which is in elderly patients, an acute psychiatric problem is usually gonna be delirium, right? Unless there's a past history of it. And the thing about delirium is it, there are many underlying etiologies of delirium that can kill you, right? So they need to be looked for and treated stat. That's the most important thing if you suspect an acute change in mental status in the elderly is to look for the underlying cause and treat that, right? And when they have done studies on what can cause delirium, number one was neurological things, TIAs and strokes. Two is infections, sepsis, urosepsis, number one, pneumonia, number two. GI number three and number four was skin infections. Cardiovascular problems, acute MI, arrhythmias, adverse drug reactions, then metabolic problems, dehydration, electrolyte imbalances, acute abdomens, trauma. And there's a very nice mnemonic in Tintinelli where the vowels plus tips of uh, AIOU tips which is a really nice mnemonic for causes of delirium. I'll let you look that up. But the chapter on coma and altered mental status in Tintinelli is a really nice reference. Right, so what about AV interventions? So the elderly have more diseases, right? They have a lot of comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, coronary artery disease, dementia. And so they need more evaluations. You're gonna to have to spend more time with them. They also have less reserve. So they're gonna more likely to crash, right? Uh, so you gotta really watch them like hawks. They need more monitoring and they need more care. So they're gonna take up more time in the emergency department than a younger patient who maybe only has one or two problems. But they're gonna have multiple problems that all may decide to crash at once. And when they fall off that cliff and start to crash from sepsis, for example, it takes a lot more work to bring them back. So what about medication management in older patients? So polypharmacy is very, very common. So how many of you have seen the brown bags? Right? They come in with a brown, now nowadays this plastic bag, whatever. They come in and there are 20 medications. There's naproxen, there's Advil, there's ibuprofen, there's Norvasc, there's nifedipine, 
there is hydrochlorothiazide, there's furosemide, there's aspirin, right? On and on and on, right? So the average older person is on 4.5 prescription drugs and then on 2.1 over-the-counter drugs. Um, how many drugs do you think I'm on? I mean, besides the cocaine and the, <laughs> you know, and the Percocets I've been popping behind the stage here. How many do you think I'm on? So this morning I took my aspirin. I took my Losartan. I, I took my uh, <clears throat> teresomide. I took my uh, <clears throat> vitamin D. I took my famotidine, right? Uh, tonight I'll take my cetirizine, my Flonase, my uh, Crestor, and uh, live happily ever after, <laughs> right? So it's not unusual to have them on a lot of medications. And adverse drug reactions, because there aren't a lot of medications, are twice as likely to occur in the older patients than they are in younger patients. In fact, in one study, half of hospital admissions for adverse drug reactions were in the elderly. So you really wanna be very careful with medications in the elderly. So how to avoid adverse drug reactions when you're prescribing? One is to try to avoid giving bad drugs. So what can guide you with that? Those so there's something called the BEARS criteria, which tell you which drugs might put older patients at risk. It doesn't mean that you can't give them, but it's always about risk benefit. Do you need to give this? Is there a better alternative? For example, anticholinergics are, can really alter older patients. And so you have to decide, do I need that Benadryl or not? Right? And then another rule we have in giving medications to the elderly is if you're gonna start a new medication, it's probably better to start low and then slowly increase than to start at the usual high dose that you might give to a younger person. So yes, I'll sometimes use NSAIDs in older people, but if I'm gonna give Naprosyn, instead of giving 500, which I would give in, in you know, younger people with an inflammatory condition, uh, in an older person, I'll probably just give 250 and give it limited just for a couple of weeks and make sure that they don't have kidney problems and GI problems, et cetera, et cetera. And then again, if you're not sure, you can always consult the pharmacist, whether you do it through the computer or you do it actually calling them, or hopefully we will have a pharmacist in the ED on both sides of the street in the near future. And uh, we used to have Teresa, who's still around, she's in the ICU mostly, but uh, when I've had called the pharmacy and sometimes she's there or some others there, I've gotten some useful information from them. And then you wanna educate the patient and their family about their medications. And I have found they appreciate that more. In fact, there's a study that was done where in patients who had fallen, they had a pharmacist in the ED who spoke to the family and went over their meds. They also actually had a physical therapist in the ED who went over things. But when they went back and asked the patients and their family what they found was most helpful, they thought it was educating them about the medications. So what about transitions of care? So if you're gonna admit, you wanna admit them appropriately. You wanna use IPASS, right? God bless uh, Taylor, who really pushed for that. But I think it's important. You, you wanna make sure that nothing ha bad happens up on the ward because we didn't let them know or they didn't hear us say that, right? If you discharge them, you wanna do it appropriately. You wanna make sure if you need social service, you get it, even if it means sometimes you have to keep them as an OBS till the next morning, because it's not safe to send them home, right? And Bobak and Eli have both told me that they have no problem keeping patients till the next morning if it's gonna be unsafe to send an elderly patient at home at three in the morning on the number two train. In fact, I go sometimes two in the morning on the number two train and I don't feel safe. And I'm a tough guy, right, Mike? 
And you wanna make sure that they have good clinic follow-up. Uh, they may need help with appointments. They may need help getting medications. And one of the things that we, we are going to be doing on the Kings County side, and we're trying to do on the UHB side, is to have a uh, follow-up. And BOBAC has arranged, for example, for the PAs and the NPs in the fast track to give them an OT in order to call up and check with the elderly patient, did you get your appointment? Are you okay at home? Or you know, did you get your medications? Is there anything we can do for, to help? So that is already started yesterday, I think, over at the county. And so that's really a good thing to have. And I think it makes a big difference. So, and then polymorbidity. So the patient presentation is really complex where they have all these different diseases and they can have different confounding effects of all these comorbidities. So the other day I had some, an elderly patient who has asthma COPD. So I gave them steroids, right? And then suddenly their sugar went up to 500 because they also had diabetes, right? And a lot of times they'll come in with all these different illnesses and it's hard to know what exactly is going on and one may affect the other. So that can make it difficult again to both diagnose and manage them. And then again, because they have all these illnesses, they have polypharmacies. So that is, as I mentioned, very common and then more likely also to get toxic from the drugs you're giving them to treat one thing like the prednisone to treat the diet, to treat the COPD that now cause hyper severe hyperglycemia. So then advanced life care, this is just something to think about, right? So one is advanced directives, right? Things like living wills, molds and pulse, and then having a health proxy. And it's something to think about at the end of life or even before they're at the very end of life to make sure they do have some arrangements in case they can't make decisions for themselves. And then palliative care, which is one of Dr. Beta's pushes at the county uh, to have to what to do with patients at the end of life and how not to make them suffer and to give them things that may make them more comfortable rather than to cure them when you can't cure them. For example, uh, someone with lung cancer who now is in severe pain and even though they're having trouble breathing, still giving them the morphine so they're not suffering in the pain uh, and suffering from the dyspnea or they're full of the death rattle kind of stuff and giving them an anticholinergic like scopolamine uh, or if they're on narcotics for their pain, knowing how to treat their constipation, right? In fact, Mark the other day was talking about a new drug that you can use for that, that almost nobody probably knows about, right? That's out for constipation due to opiates and, and it's especially useful in older people who are constipation due to opiates. So in summary, some of the important principles are the elderly have comorbidities. It makes the diagnosis and treatment more difficult. The diseases present atypically, so it makes it harder to diagnose them. They have less reserve so that you compensate rapidly. And then they have an increased risk of ADRs. And they need really more care, both in the ED, but after they're discharged. So in summary, also you wanna do the right thing for our older patients, always. And I know all of you wanna do that. And that's what we're trying to do by trying to get all these changes to be able to be an accredited uh, geriatric ED. And then this is one of my nicest pictures I've ever come across, right? This is from Haiti and caring. Any questions? Okay, thank you.